Good morning and good evening to our viewers from around the world. My name is Alfred Ball, and I represent Education USA and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. This week's interactive webinar is part of our Celebration of International Education Week, a joint initiative of the Department of State and the Department of Education to provide programs that prepare American students for global challenges and that enable students from abroad to study and learn in the United States. Our goal today is to provide you with information on the admissions process for American colleges and universities. We understand that getting all the necessary paperwork and documents in order can be a real challenge. That's why later in the program we'll be joined by Tamara Lapman. She's the Associate Director of Admission at the University of Richmond. Tamara will provide advice and tips on how best to navigate the admissions process when applying to U.S. colleges and universities. If you have questions you would like her to answer during the program, simply post them in the discussion section below. You can also ask your questions on Twitter using the hashtag EducationUSA. Also joining us today are two viewing groups from the Palestinian territories, the American Corner uh, Nablus, located at Najah University, and Amidist, Gaza City. Welcome and thank you so much for participating in our Facebook Live event. We will be coming back to you throughout the program for your questions. We would like to welcome other viewing groups gathered at U.S. embassies, American spaces, Fulbright commissions, binational centers, universities around the world, and many other places. I would now like to introduce you to two international students, Min Huang and Nikki McCallum. Min is from South Korea and is currently enrolled as an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Nikki is from Hong Kong and studying at Pepperdine University. Min, uh, what is the focus of your degree and can you tell us why you chose to study in the, in the United States? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I study uh, political science and international studies and I chose to study here in the United States not only to adapt to a more globalizing world, but also to, because uh, I also realized that a lot of professors and scholars that are in, on top of any kind of subject uh, reside and work here in the United States. That's fantastic, thank you. Nikki. Yes, my major is in business administration, and there are two main reasons for me to come to the United States to study. And first is because of the liberal arts system. I think I should learn more than only my major subjects in order for me to be more rounded. This will prepare me better for the business world. And also the second reason is that I think the great business atmosphere in the United States can inspire me with more insights in this field. That, that's fantastic. Thank you. Nikki, let me stay with you um, and ask you, what piece of advice would you give international students when starting the process to attend a university in the United um, States? <clears throat> I would say that um, it is good for you to search on which schools you would like and learn more about the school life over there before you apply to the school. Okay, uh, Min? Yeah. Oh, um, I would say start the process early, uh, know vaguely of what you want and start like researching on uh, what each fa like universities and colleges are famous for. So there are 4,700 accredited American uh, colleges and universities. That's a lot to choose from. Yes, uh, I can a lot imagine. of choices. <laughs> right. Um, Min, I know you began your education in the U.S. as a high school student. Um, what were some of the resources that you found helpful when you were beginning to look into colleges and universities? Uh, good question. So if you are fortunate to uh, start your education here in the United States in high school, I would say, I mean, everyone can be a resource. Uh, the, the teachers that teach you, uh, the, the high school advisors, uh, each school has like an advisor uh, for the students. But, at this, but if, you are, um, if you don't start your high school education here in the United States, the internet is always a good resource. But I want to encourage everyone to like look beyond the rankings, just because um, there are so many other schools that are uh, good and good in like variety of subjects uh, that are not always like included in the rankings. So like a good way to start researching would be like just reading about what you like and then uh, just noting the names of the professors and the scholars who are quoted or who even author those papers or uh, videos and then just starting your uh, university searches through that way. That, that's very good advice. Nikki, is there something you'd add to that uh, from your perspective? I think uh, what's Min mentioned is that you can use internet to search um, many of the information for a school. There are also uh, websites that help you to 
uh, make better decisions, I think internet is a great resource. That's fantastic. And there are so many schools um, that people need to find um, because, as you say, the rankings can be very, you know, they're, they're certainly not everything, far from it. Um, far and from it. very important for, for kids to realize that there are thousands of excellent schools with scholarships, with resources uh, for them to look at. Um, I'm wondering, did either of you apply early um, for early action? Yes. And I mean, how, how did, what was your experience? Well, um, well, just to let you know, uh, applying early action is a lot of work just because you have to like prepare a lot, but I think it's worth it uh, just because applying for early action, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, gives you a, a better chance of being accepted to uh, the university. So like it's a good opportunity to uh, try out for the universities that you want to reach out for, like the, the ones that are kind of harder, I would say. Did, uh, did, it, did you make it? Is that... No, I did not, but I don't regret it. Oh, that, uh, excellent. Nikki? Yeah. Same for me. I also got rejected by my early decision. However, it is a good first taste for us to uh, taste how it feels to apply to schools. And I think, yeah, the process for us to research on how to apply to our early decision school uh, is a good practice. Okay, that sounds like excellent advice. Um, what about the Common App? Did you, were all the applications the Common App? Were some different? Um, Nikki, do you want to start? Yes, uh, I applied to uh, 13 universities in the United States and I applied to all of them through Common Application. I think it's a really helpful app for you to uh, submit the general document. However, you need to uh, write essays for each different universities. Okay, interesting. Uh, maybe shall we move on to, to essays? I mean, what was your experience with essays? Is there any advice you'd give students? I would say um, start early, brainstorm what you want to write about, just because it's a great opportunity to like show who you are. And at the same time, you only get 500 words. So like you have to be very concise uh, with what you want to say. So like I would say brainstorm early, um, just try to like uh, capture the image or the message that you want that can like concisely carry out um, the message of like who you are. So I would say start brainstorming early and please don't feel afraid or shy to like show your writing to other people just because it is those kind of interactions that will like improve your paper and make it more successful. Okay, Nikki? Yeah. I also think it's a great process to learn more about yourself. So because you have to write so much about yourself, it's good for you to write more subjectively. It's not like writing a research paper. You need to uh, tell more about who you are instead of what you are thinking about. Just a, an off-the-wall question. Do, do you remember what uh, some of the essays were or one of them? Yes, I remember one really interesting question asking, um, what is your opinion of faith or how faith helped you to uh, grow in your life? And I think this is something that I fought through for many light, nights and then uh, yeah. So it's it's to get you to think, right? Yes. And to, as well as to write. Sorry, Min. Do you mind if I add a prompt? Please. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I just remembered it. Uh, one university um, asked me to compare apples to oranges, and it was one of the hardest essay questions to work for. That, so is, I mean, is your advice that students really need to think about this and be creative, but also not be afraid to, to lay out what they think? Yes. Yes, I think be yourself is the most important thing. Okay, because universities want to get to know you as, as an individual? Yes, because I think many of the admissions are humans too, so they want to know more about your story. They're the human who care about it. Very interesting. That's, I think that's excellent advice. Um, so is, um, I know that one of the big uh, elements of the process that can be a challenge for students overseas is recommendations. And I'm wondering if you have any advice about whom to approach for a recommendation or how the process works. Min, do you want to? Yeah, uh, I can start. Uh, so your teachers are always a good place to start just because they know uh, what kind of a student you are. And, um, but it, the recommendation letters don't have to be limited to teachers. Uh, they can also be uh, to, um, like, let's say, if you were involved in an extracurricular activity, uh, your coaches, your a any kind of um, people who were older than you, I would say, who knew, who knows what kind of a people, what kind of a person you are. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for international students, you always have to uh, worry about the translation services because some uh, teachers do not know how to write in English 
because it's a foreign place. Yeah, so just be cautious about that. Okay, that sounds like very good advice. Nikki? Yes, I think just one thing I want to add to what Min said is that you can, if you had internship in any workplace, uh, your boss or your supervisor is a great place to start too. Okay, did you have to explain what a recommendation was? Um, did, do, do people understand you know, the idea that a, that a university would be asking someone about you? I think teachers or supervisors are expected to uh, write these letters, but if they do not know, you can uh, simply show them the instruction. Okay, very interesting. Um, and I know that one a big part of the application process for some universities is an interview, is a personal interview. Um, did either of you have an interview and what was your experience? How would you advise on preparing? Um, Nikki, do you want to start with that? Sure, because um, the time when I was applying, I was actually in Hong Kong, so I did not have the chance to do interviews with uh, the school administrations. However, I did have four interviews with uh, school alumni and then through them, I can understand more about the school and school can also have uh, some understanding on me too. Okay, excellent. And were those interviews, what were the kinds of things that they talked about? Uh, it's pretty much like coffee time. You go into a coffee and then you two discussing about uh, why do you want to apply to this university and questions like that. Okay, and I can say from my own personal experience, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, I was interviewed by an alumnus of the school where I went, um, who at, it was, and it was exactly that coffee time, yes. sort of very relaxed, very nice, and trying to get to know me as a young person. Yes. So I'm glad to hear that that, uh, that hasn't changed. Min, was, was that your experience as well? Uh, kind of. I, I, I also did face-to-face, -face and I did Skype at the same time. Um, yeah, and just going along with both of you, uh, it was like coffee time questions, and they also like asked me about my uh, career questions, like what you want to do, what are you passionate about, what are your interests are. So like having those answers kind of prepared, um, I think will be very helpful if you are doing an interview. Okay, did um, did it was was the Skype session difficult in any way? Was it different sort of you know? Is it different in person versus when you're on camera? It's a little bit more awkward in the beginning, but you know, after after the introductions, the ice breaks down, and then it's as comfortable. I mean, the uh, the advisors who come to talk to you, or the alumnus or the alumni, uh, they try their best to like make the interview as comfortable as for you, just because they know um, as an interviewer that this is uh, your your first interview experience. So it also doesn't have to be perfect. I imagine. I mean, so so for example, you know, the dog runs into the room. That's that. Don't worry, right? It's oh, uh, they want to see you as a as a person in, yes. in where you live and mm -hmm. and uh, kind of get to know you. Yes. Is that fair? Okay, that's fantastic. So um, before we end, I I wonder quickly what were the key factors that um, led you that th led you through the process uh, in terms of also deciding where to apply. Is there any part of the process itself? Um, that influenced your decision about, about where to apply? Um, I think um, it's good if your high school have counselors, you can start with talking to them. They will guide you through the process. And I think that's a uh, really important factor that helped me to apply to search on different schools. Min, any? Uh, a big factor for me was the cost. And so uh, I, I looked into uh, the schools, like, you know, according to the cost. And then I, I was able to find out that some schools, although they're not in the rankings, they have one of the world's best programs in, like, certain subject areas. And they are cheaper at the same time. And so it's, so, like, go, yeah, so knowing what you want and being open to unexpected uh, opportunities that come to you and then just embracing that. That's fantastic. And certainly at Education USA, that's one of the things we try to promote the most is that our advisors are looking to help students find the right fit yes. in a school, right? To make sure that they realize that there are 4,700 excellent accredited institutions all, all over the country um, and that students need to dig deep um, in order to find, you know, what the right school is for them uh, and that they have lots of options. There's always the fit. Yes. There's a, the yeah, right there, fit, there, exactly. The right fit. Um, before we end, any last piece of advice you'd give students um, about the about the the whole process hmm I would say 
don't be afraid. Um, you know, coming to the United States, most of most of the foreigners have to fly, and you know, it's usually it's an, an, another hemisphere. But like, it sounds scary at the first time. I mean, it sounds scary to me. It, you know, just studying in the United States by myself with no family in the country sounded scary. But when you come here, everyone's very accommodating, and it's not as bad as you imagine. It's amazing. It's it's a great place to study. That's fant that's fantastic, yes. Nikki. I think. Um, one thing is about SAT or ACT, this kind of standard test, uh, they are not everything, of course. But however, you need to be aware and prepare earlier for those exams. So take the exams seriously, but they're also not everything. Yes. Um, schools are looking you at you as kind of a, a whole yes. human being and student. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, Min and Nikki, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to hear more from Min and Nikki, they will be participating in our Facebook chat. Just ask your questions in the discussion section below. They'll be online to answer your questions throughout the rest of the program. Coming up next, Tamara Lapman will join us. She is going to discuss how the college admission process works and what you can do to improve your chances of getting into a school that's right for you. Remember, if you've got questions or topics you want her to address, please ask them in the discussion section below. You can also post your questions on Twitter using the hashtag EducationUSA. Right now, we want to spotlight some of the things we do here at Education USA and share a short message from our partner school for this webinar, the University of Richmond. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Fred Boll. I represent Education USA at the U.S. Department of State here in Washington, D.C. With over 400 advising centers around the world, Education USA is the U.S. Department of State's official source for finding the right U.S. college or university for your studies. American universities and U.S. communities value international students, and they are sending a strong message of welcome through the You Are Welcome Here campaign. Whoever you are and wherever you're from, Come join the more than 1 million international students currently studying in all 50 U.S. states. I encourage you to visit an Education USA advising center near you today. You can find us at educationusa.state.gov to learn more. Why do I love the University of Richmond? Where else can you find a leading liberal arts university with a top-ranked business school, the nation's first leadership school, plus strong professional and graduate programs, and Division I athletics? At Richmond, we're led by faculty who are experts in their fields and also know us by name. And we're guaranteed funding to support one summer internship or research project anywhere in the world. The University of Richmond. Make it your own. Welcome back. I would now like to introduce Tamara Lapman. Tamara has worked in undergraduate admission for the past 12 years and is currently the Associate Director of Admission at the University of Richmond in Virginia. Tamara, before we get started, um, let's check in with our viewing groups in Gaza and Nablus to find uh, out some of the things that students are interested in learning about. Um, Amid East Gaza City, uh, can I turn to you? What are the topics you would like to hear about?
Hi, Gaza. Yeah, we are very pleased to hear about the quality education process and how to get like financial aid or scholarship. Okay, so the question is about financial aid and scholarships. What is the best approach? Um, thank you very much, Gaza. Well. To, to get started, I think it's so important that you do research. As you've already heard, there are so many colleges and universities in the U.S. with so many different policies. Um, so is it possible to find a school where you're able to get the financial aid or scholarships you need? Absolutely. It's just going to take a bit of homework uh, and really making sure that you follow all the deadlines and application requirements to get that consideration. Is, uh, is financial aid linked to the application itself? Is it, does it happen at the same time? For most schools, yes. Again, there's going to be differences from school to school, but typically those two processes run concurrently. Uh, and at the same time that we're reviewing a student for admission, uh, we are reviewing them for potential merit scholarships uh, and need-based aid if a school is uh, offering those to international students. Uh, we know that those are so closely linked for students and families. We want to make sure that we're giving you all the information at the same time. Okay, excellent. Uh, Gaza, do you have uh, one more question? Uh, I think for now we don't have any questions, so let's see. That's great. Thank you very much, Gaza. Let me turn to the American corner in Nablus. Um, what are some of the things that you are interested in learning about? <coughs> Hello. We want to learn more about the GPA and the disc, uh, the disc scores, the TOEFL uh, test and the, the DRE and the IELTS test scores. Uh, we want to know about what, what to look for in the university. And I want to I want to I want to ask another thing about GPA. So um, so my GPA is 2.6 and I, I already checked for three requirements, three, three, three universities requirements. Uh, university, the universities are University of Texas at Dallas at Arlington and University of North Texas. So they require they require a GPA of at least three. I'm a GPS 2.6, so do I have a chance um, in order to continue the, the, the operation of doing the exams, the GRE and TOEFL exams? That's my question, and that's our question. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Nablus. That's an excellent question. So to repeat quickly, um, the questions are about uh, test scores, GREs, other standardized tests, what students should expect and plan for in terms of, you know, if a, if a, a level is set, um, does that mean that they have to be at that level? What, I guess, what's the flexibility around that? And the same question for GPA. So if a school says we require a GPA of X and the student's GPA is slightly less than X, um, does that, how should the student assess that in terms of uh, submitting an application? Excellent questions. Well, the first thing to know is as we are reviewing applications and, and our applicants, uh, our first priority is to make sure that they're academically prepared to be successful, to come in uh, and to just jump right into our curriculum and, of course, then to be successful and graduate in four years. Uh, and so looking at a student's academic preparedness from their transcript, their GPA, maybe standardized test scores, essays, all of that helps paint a picture of that. Uh, some schools practice holistic admission, where we're really getting to know you as a, as a whole person, uh, and there might be uh, less stringent or less rigid minimum requirements. So for example, uh, at Richmond, we don't have minimums, but rather ranges. Uh, but you're going to need to look at every school you apply to and see whether that would be the case for them. So will each school actually tell students this is what we're looking at and how we're looking at it? Typically, yes. Uh, and our websites are the very best resource for the most accurate, most up-to-date information. Uh, and so we'll tell you exactly what materials we're looking for, so whether we require uh, standardized tests uh, and whether there's a minimum requirement. Uh, and, and we put those requirements out there uh, because those are all the things that we're, we're really looking for. And we spend a lot of time and energy getting to know our applicants, uh, again, with that goal of making sure that they're going to be successful uh, and have a really uh, strong four-year experience on our campuses. Okay, that, that's fantastic. Um, so it sounds like students, as in all things, have to dig deep um, into each school, into each school that they're applying to, that they're interested in, to see what the parameters are of what the school is looking for. Exactly. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. Um, Nablus, do you have another question, or shall we turn to our online viewers? I'm happy to come back to you later. We are fine for now. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate the question, and we'll come back later to see if, if you have any follow-up. Um, 
Let us uh, turn to some uh, questions from viewers. With those topics in mind, um, do you want to maybe begin by um, just giving some general advice about the, the best process for students to pursue their education? Absolutely. Well, as, as you heard from the last segment, there are so many options within the United States. Uh, and for students to do their research uh, and apply to schools that are the best fit for them is really the best way to start the process. Um, there's really three points of decision within the college application and admission process. And the first lies for the student uh, in selecting what schools they're going to apply to. Uh, and so I think really using that as an empowering place to, uh, to think about what's the right uh, fit in terms of size or location and academic programs. Uh, and then that's going to really help a student improve their chances if they're applying to schools that are a good fit uh, and have a really well-crafted list. Um, perhaps some schools that are more of a reach, some that are a bit more of a safety, um, but to have options. Uh, and then as the admission teams are, are carefully reviewing applications, um, it gives us a, a better sense of, of what you would be able to contribute and bring to our campus. Okay, fantastic. Do you want to talk about timelines, uh, requirements, uh, the, the basic process? Absolutely. Uh, and I'll preface by saying every school in the U.S. is going to be a little bit different. Again, research is so important. Uh, early decision and early action are pretty common plans that you might find. Uh, so if you're thinking about the process early um, and are really anxious and eager to get started, those can be great options, uh, but it's important to know the limitations. So an early decision application would be binding in most cases, meaning that you're only applying to one school, and if you're admitted, you're committed to going there. Uh, so that's not the right choice for every student. Um, there are early action plans, which allow you to hear back sooner, but without that binding commitment. And then there are regular decision deadlines, and some schools follow rolling admission, uh, where you really have a lot more flexibility. Of course, you still need to meet the deadlines, um, but then once you would hear back, uh, you have time in the spring to consider your options uh, before ultimately making a decision by May 1st. Uh, May 1st is a really important date in American higher education. Um, it's an enrollment confirmation deadline, um, so we're able to reserve a spot in the class and potentially in campus housing uh, for the students enrolling in the fall. So students who um, do or try for early admission but don't make it, are they then considered again in, in the wider pool of students applying? They can be. So many schools will defer students, especially if there's additional information we might get. So sometimes a student has applied in the fall, but we know that they're taking the SAT again, or they're taking the TOEFL, or they're still in school and we want to see their mid-year grades, their next, next exam scores. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why we might defer a student, so we can really give them another chance and another look in a later application pool. Okay, that's good. Um, what about uh, financial aid and uh, scholarships? Absolutely. Um, it's probably the most common question I get when recruiting internationally. Uh, and what's uh, great is that there are schools in the United States that will review international students for merit scholarships. Some will review for need-based financial aid, some both, and some neither. Uh, but typically, uh, schools will ask you to submit your application for financial aid at the time you apply for admission. So transparency in that, understanding what you and your family are going to need is important. Uh, so need-based financial aid is based on what your, you and your family are able to pay towards your cost of attendance for four years. Whereas merit scholarships uh, might be rewarding you for your academic achievements or perhaps other talents or skills, whether that's athletics or the arts or other things. Uh, but it's very important to, to follow those deadlines uh, and to, to understand some of the other terminology. Uh, so while some schools might be need blind in their process, meaning that your need for financial aid is not considered, they might not guarantee that they'll meet full demonstrated need. Uh, so if you are going to need full financial aid to attend school in the United States, finding a school that is going to meet your full demonstrated need is, is really, really important. And that's our philosophy to ensure that you're able to take us up on that offer of admission uh, and not worry about paying for school for your four years. Thank you, that's excellent advice. I'd like to point out that um, for reference, uh, viewers can uh, look at Education USA webinars, uh, previous interactive webinars, uh, specifically on financial aid issues, which you can find uh, through our website or also on YouTube. Um, Tamara, once students have done their research, uh, gathered the right documents, and filled out paperwork, what are some of the things they should keep in mind before submitting the final application? So most important is to put your best foot forward and to be yourself. So in a holistic review process, we're really looking to get to know you as a whole person. Yes, your academic preparation is, is most important, um, but as we're building classes and communities, we want to know what else you're going to contribute. Um, so make sure that those things that you've spent your time and energy on are reflected in your application. It doesn't have to be just a traditional school-based club. It might be something that you do in your community. It might be a part-time job or family responsibilities. Um, we're really wanting to understand what passions and interests you're going to bring to us. Um, so making sure that that all comes through 
making sure that your essays are um, great representations of your writing, um, but also share your voice. Uh, and again, making sure that you're meeting deadlines uh, and submitting everything that we're looking for. So it's a little bit like um, preparing for class, making sure if you want a good grade, you also have to do uh, the right work to prepare and make sure that you're ready for the test. Absolutely. And I should say that we don't expect you to figure all of that out on your own. Uh, on our websites, again, where you can find some great details about the process, you can also find contact information for your admission officer. So typically schools will have uh, admission counselors that work with different parts of the world. Um, and we're really excited then to be your resource and potentially an advocate for you as you go through that process. Uh, and so don't be shy to reach out to us. So students could send an email. Is that right? Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, do you want to uh, talk about standardized testing at all? Sure. Uh, so standardized testing may be one piece of that holistic review for some colleges and universities. Uh, and it's because we, uh, we're well equipped to review curricula and grades from all over the world, wherever you're attending school. But standardized tests give us that standard across the world and across all of our applicants. Um, so typically, it is just one factor of many that we're looking at. Um, and there are some schools now that have moved to a more test flexible or a test optional policy. So I know in some parts of the world, it can be challenging to find a testing center or to fit that in timing wise. Um, so if that is the case for you, um, there may be other schools to look at who don't uh, place as high an emphasis on that. Um, but if it is a requirement, it is something that we need you to have completed, again, before our deadline. Do, and do schools take into account that, I mean, many international students are not native English speakers, that, of course, they're coming with, you know, rich and different backgrounds? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we are understanding that as we're reviewing your transcripts, reading your essays, um, certainly looking at SAT and ACT scores. And in some cases, if, if English isn't a student's first language, we're looking for an English proficiency exam, so typically TOEFL or IELTS. Uh, and again, that's helping us to understand if a student is really well prepared to jump into our curriculum, uh, especially if you're going to be expected to participate in class right away and to be writing essays uh, and lengthy papers in English. All of those pieces help us to ensure that you're ready uh, to be successful in that. And I know that U.S. universities and colleges are very focused on their student success, right? I mean, you want them. That's, I think, one of the special things about the United States is that um, every, you know, our whole system is designed to see students succeed in the end, and we want a relationship with students that lasts their whole lifetime, right? Um, they become alumni. Um, they engage the United States communities. Um, I think that's one of the strong messages that U.S. higher education sends. Absolutely. And, and our diverse campuses are one of our most valuable resources. Um, so we really value having a wide array of, of backgrounds and perspectives and experiences uh, because students aren't just learning from their professors. They're learning from each other. Uh, you're not just a student in a classroom, but you might be someone's roommate, someone's teammate. Uh, and so we want to understand um, that you're contributing in so many ways during your four years and then beyond. That's fantastic. Could you um, tell, I'm sure students are curious about how decisions are communicated when you do make a decision. Absolutely. Well, as I referenced before, so that first point of decision is for the student. Where are you going to apply? Uh, and then we spend many, many weeks and months reviewing those applications. And when it's time for us to release decisions, typically for students outside the US, we do that electronically. So it gets to you more quickly. Um, so some schools will send an email. Others might have an application portal uh, where you have login credentials and at a specified date and time can go online to get your decision, typically related to admission and financial aid if you've applied for that. And, uh, and then again, if you're in an early decision plan, that might be the end of the road. Uh, but in other non-binding plans, that starts the comparison game and maybe thinking about asking more questions, connecting with current students or professors as you make that ultimate decision of where to enroll. So and financial aid um, information will be communicated at the same time. Is that typical? Typically, yes. We understand that, again, for so many students, paying for college is a really important part of that decision. Uh, and so if you've submitted all of the application materials, we want to make sure that we're communicating the full decision to you. Uh, and then certainly you can ask questions, but typically we are putting out um, every possible aid opportunity for you at that time. Uh, so anything that you're qualified for, need or merit based. That's fantastic. Do, um, do you want to talk at all about what you hear from students, any perceived you know, barriers or concerns that they have, questions that, you know, that, uh, that get sent to you? 
Absolutely. Um, so, so many students are really worried about affording a U.S. education. Uh, and I think it's important, again, to know that there are so many schools in the U.S. Um, with great opportunities because we want international students on our campuses. We know how much you'll enrich our communities. Uh, and so we offer resources for you. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of finding the schools that have that. Um, similarly, when there are concerns about standardized testing, access to it, or maybe you're just not a great standardized test taker, uh, that might be a case where you find a school that doesn't place as much emphasis or doesn't require that. Um, so part of the beauty of, of American higher education is the variety uh, and why uh, finding that right fit is so important. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. It's we um, Education USA is dedicated to promoting you know all 4,700 uh, colleges and universities equally, and we really want students to understand the great uh, variety uh, and richness of American higher education that, the, that, that really means that they can find a best fit for each individual. Absolutely, and, and that's our goal throughout the process. Well, thank you very much, Tamara. This is very valuable information. Um, let's quickly go back to our viewing groups gathered uh, in, uh, in the Palestinian territories. How about the um, American corner in Nablus? Um, or, sorry, Gaza's online now. Um, Gaza, do you have a, a follow-up question you'd like to ask? Um. Is it Naples or Gaza? Yeah. Sorry, Gaza. Gaza, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello. I have a question. If I'm accepted, uh, may I delay my offer of admission to the next year? So the very good question. Thank you. Uh, if I'm accepted, can I delay my offer, my acceptance uh, for a year? Typically, the answer is going to be yes. Uh, we will defer an acceptance. Uh, for a period, usually one year or two years. Uh, what's important is that you let us know why. Uh, and we know there are many great reasons why a student might take a gap in their education. Um, but typically, if you have decided to enroll in another college or university during that time, you would need to reapply. I see, OK. Um, Gaza, any further questions? Yes, actually. Regarding the, um, the personal statement, we, I believe that in every application, when we apply for a university, there must be um, a writing for um, personal statement essay. So what are the most important things that we should take care of when writing our personal statement regarding the style, regarding the things that attract um, the admission officers? Thank you very much, Gaza. Um, so the question is about uh, personal essays. Um, what are the most important things that admissions offers are looking at? What should students be thinking about as they're writing their essays? Um, could you t talk a little bit about those? Of course. So when we're reviewing essays, um, we're really looking for two different things. One is your writing ability. So we want to make sure that it's a well-crafted uh, essay and that you're answering the question that you've chosen to answer. Uh, but beyond that, we're really looking to hear your voice. So we want to get to know you, the applicant, better. Um, if you think about all the other pieces of your application, um, we have letters of recommendation where we're hearing about you from others. Um, we're hearing a list of your activities, uh, seeing your grades, seeing your scores. The essay is the one chance you have to really let your voice shine through. And that's important because we want to hear that voice, that voice that you'd be bringing to our campus and our community for four years. So I assume that also coming from you know, students who are not native English speakers, that voice might not, it not, might not there, there might be some you know, uh, mistakes in the essay, because, but what you're looking for is the ideas and the, the real person that's behind the essay, right? Absolutely. And, and we understand that context. We understand where you're coming from in that. And we expect the essay to look that way then. Um, so while certainly getting trusted people to review it, to get some, uh, some tips, um, we don't want it to look like some, that someone else wrote it. Right. Um, so we expect uh, that it's going to come from someone who's perhaps 17 or 18 years old, um, who has been studying English for a portion of their education, uh, and who is uh, you know, putting their, their thoughts and their voice out there through that essay. I'm sure you can mostly tell um, if someone else looks like it's been, if it's been written by someone else, essentially, right? Right. And, and authenticity is so important throughout the process. As, as colleges and universities, we're sharing with you what you can expect when you get to our campuses. So we want students to do the same through their application. Uh, so we know what we're getting um, if we admit you and you join us. Uh, we want to understand that voice that you'll bring. That, that's great. Gaza, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, let's now go to the American Corner in Nablus. Um, Nablus, do you have a question for us? Yeah, actually, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, is there any opportunity to get MA and degree and PhD degree 
at the same time. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is, are there opportunities to do more than one degree at the same time, BA, MA, PhD, uh, combined degrees? Some schools will offer that, uh, and every one of our websites is going to tell you exactly what our academic offerings are. And there are some schools that will allow you to pursue two degrees at the same time, or maybe have an accelerated route towards a graduate degree. Uh, and so there might be different admission requirements. Some schools, when they are reviewing you for admission as a first year student, will review you into those accelerated or dual degree tracks. Other schools will allow you to come in and apply for that once you're already on our campus. Does it um, depend on the subject you're studying oftentimes? So a school, for example, might have that track for certain subjects but not for others? Exactly. It, it could. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent question. Uh, Nablus, any further questions? Yeah, actually, I have another question. Uh, besides education USA, uh, what are the websites we can visit to find good uh, MA programs with scholarships? So aside from, uh, other than Education USA, are there resources for students um, looking at programs uh, with scholarships attached? Sure. Institutional websites, so actual university websites, are going to be some of the best resources because we're, you can feel confident that they are up to date and fully accurate. Uh, and if you don't find all of the details that you want on that page for a particular program, uh, there's typically contact information and you can reach out uh, and ask um, because we know that that's a really important, you know, knowing if scholarships are available might matter when you're deciding whether or not to apply. So that's one of those specific uh, areas where you actually might write an email and follow up and, and ask specific questions of a, of a school. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Nablus, uh, welcome. We have another question. I have a question. Just I would like to ask about the Fulbright, Fulbright Scholarship. Uh, is the, is it's uh, for all universities in the United States or not? And uh, what's the eligibilities for that? So the question is about Fulbright scholarships and whether or not it applies to all universities in the United States, what the parameters are, what el eligibility is. I don't know if that's... Well, I, I mean, I'll admit that that's not my area of expertise. However, on our campus, we have an office of scholarships and fellowships. Uh, and so there are offices and student services to help you apply for things like Fulbrights or other um, scholarships and fellowships down the line. Um, so you know exactly what's necessary and exactly what to do. Uh, and, and so I think that really ties into all of the different support services and resources on our campuses. And again, on our websites as well, we know that if you're coming from a distance, um, that can be the best way to learn about those opportunities. The, and let me say from, thank you very much, Tamara, and let me say from the Department of State side, we are honored to house uh, the, the Fulbright program uh, in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Um, it's one of the, it's the major uh, flagship exchange program for the United States government. There are many different possibilities for students under Fulbright. Um, I encourage you to look at um, the specific websites um, related to Fulbright directly um, to see the, what different scholarships are possible. That can happen uh, through your uh, American embassy or consulate locally. They will have information. Education USA certainly will have information. Um, and likewise, the State Department's own website um, will have direct information. Uh, specific programs linked to universities go to that university uh, for, for the information. Um, it's a program that we're very proud of um, and, uh, and that, that uh, does offer great opportunity for students. Thank you very much uh, to Gaza and Nablus. Uh, it's now tame, time to uh, get some questions from our online viewers. Um, so first up, a Facebook question from a viewing group in the International Resource Center in Kigali, Rwanda. Thank you. Um, the question is, what are the benefits of studying in the USA compared to other countries? It's a, a big question, an excellent question. Um, how, how, how would you describe that from higher education's perspective? Sure. Well, one of the, one of the most beautiful things uh, about American higher education is that you're able to study a variety of fields. Uh, so in many uh, systems around the world, students uh, have narrowed down their, their courses of study uh, even before they get to the university level and are really, really focused in on that uh, as they complete their degree. In the United States, there are many opportunities to um, combine programs, to pursue interdisciplinary studies, and to be undecided. Uh, and so we see a lot of students who come in, who enter our schools, who have lots of interests. And that's great. We encourage that. And we're going to help you to connect with things that you want to study in more depth, that you're going to build that expertise and have that major or majors. But at the same time, you're going to get that breadth of an education. 
So it's breadth, flexibility, offer. Um, I, I would add, uh, from, from my own side, is of course the quality of U.S. higher education. Through and through, students um, are exposed to the best resources, the best teachers. Um, and one thing that we at Education USA hear frequently from partners is that they notice how Focus schools are on student success. It's not just a question in the United States of students moving through the system, graduating, um, but actually being looked at as individual students. Um, and, um, and schools make an investment in their uh, students' professional careers as well. Um, so, you know, schools don't just think of you as a student, they think of you as a person, and they really want you to succeed. Um, so, let's go to our next question. Um, uh, also from Facebook, do schools consider all your academic interests when you apply or just the subject you want to major in when you're a student? Excellent question. The answer really is going to be dependent on the school. So I'd say to generalize, at a, a much larger university, uh, you might be applying directly into a college or a school, a particular program, in which case, yes, in the admission process, we are considering that. Uh, particularly at liberal arts and sciences uh, colleges and universities, uh, we certainly want to know what you're interested in, but we're not going to review you solely for that. Uh, most students will come in uh, and explore, and then at these schools, you would apply uh, to a major or declare that major, usually in your second year. Okay. Um, and if, I mean, is, but that, does that mean anything to have anything to do with whether or not a student can change majors? It does. It does. So at a school where you have to apply, say, to a school of engineering from day one, um, that might be very difficult to transfer out of that into a school of business uh, or to get into a school um, that you haven't been in, uh, that you haven't been accepted to from day one. Um, whereas at other schools, there's a lot more flexibility um, and more, uh, of an understanding that if you've been admitted to the university, we feel like you're well qualified to study anything that you wish. And we know that students are going to change their mind, uh, usually more than once. Uh, and so our system can be set up um, to allow for that and to make sure that students are able to, to change majors when that change of heart happens. So students should look very carefully at each university. Um, it sounds like going from sociology to psychology is probably not too difficult, but that if you want to go from engineering to um, history, that that might be a different school. And so, so uh, students need to look at that and think, OK, um, what does this mean for the application process? Exactly. Fantastic advice. Um, we have another question from a student in Morocco. Um, he says, I'm in the 11th grade. When do I have to apply for universities? And how do I use the common application? Well, I'm going to set that up with our current calendar year, um, which will hopefully help to clarify that. Uh, so for students who are planning to start their university studies in the fall of 2018, our application process started in the fall. So our first deadline, and many schools' first deadlines, were in November of 2017. Um, so it's usually the late summer and early fall of year 12, of grade 12, that students are beginning their applications, typically in anticipation of deadlines um, that are in the late fall or winter. Um, and then the, the final decision of where to enroll being May 1st uh, of that year that you're enrolling. So as for the common application, um, the common application uh, can be started each year uh, August 1st and students are able to start submitting their applications. Uh, and it really does streamline the process a bit and, uh, and allow students to, to start doing that. And then as they're, they're crafting their list, narrowing down the schools they're going to apply to, uh, they can begin working on those uh, more specific requirements, maybe an additional essay or requesting an additional letter of recommendation that a school might require. Uh, but starting earlier with the common application is a great way to, um, to feel like you're, you're making progress, to uh, maybe get some of the nerves out a little bit, uh, and, to, and to help yourself uh, meet those later deadlines. We can tell when the application has been started and finished uh, that night of the deadline, and it's typically not putting the student's best foot forward. I, I can imagine. So prepare, do your homework, and it sounds like looking at schools well in advance, you know, a year and a half, two years, um, is not too early. Absolutely. Uh, so when I'm traveling and, and meeting with students at schools around the world, it's not just those who are applying in the current year. Um, it might be those who are one or even two years younger, uh, and they're starting to look, and I really appreciate that. Um, and so it's great. It's okay to have more basic questions as you're gaining an understanding. Uh, we're here to help you. We're here to help educate you on the opportunities um, and to know what you might need to achieve. So whether there is a minimum GPA or whether there are standardized tests that you'll need to sign up for and take, um, certainly getting an early start is going to be in your best interest. That's great advice. 
Uh, we have another question uh, from Facebook. Do I need to send all documents at one time to the university when I go through the admission process, or can I send my test scores later, for example? So usually it's absolutely fine to send things piece by piece, um, and we uh, have great offices in place to compile all of that uh, and to make sure that once we've received everything and your application is complete, uh, it's ready to be reviewed. Um, so that's certainly fine. Through the Common Application, there's a great way for your school official to send your transcripts, to send those official school documents that we need. Uh, so you as the applicant wouldn't be submitting uh, a transcript or a letter of recommendation. That can be done online uh, anytime after you've submitted your application. Uh, and likewise, test scores will come from testing agencies at a later time, and that's absolutely fine. So that's fine. Will schools let students know when their application is complete? Sometimes. Um, so many times uh, universities have some kind of portal. So similar to the, the decision portal I mentioned earlier, where students might be able to log on to get their admission decision. Uh, we also frequently have a portal where students can log on uh, at any point to see what we've received and what we're still waiting for. Uh, and so that can be a really, really great tool for you to manage that uh, and to make sure that everything gets to us on time. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so another question from Education USA in Maracaibo, Venezuela. Are international students eligible to work on campus? How does the work study program actually work? Great question. Uh, so campus work study is a great opportunity for students to earn some additional funding towards their expenses. Uh, and although international students wouldn't be eligible for federal funds to do that, many schools have institutional funds dedicated to that. Uh, and so you will find that you can apply for a job on our campus, typically where you're only working uh, a reasonable number of hours a week because of course we know that you're a student first and foremost um, but that can be a great way to earn some extra money towards books or travel expenses or to put towards tuition okay fantastic thank you uh, another question um, from Nepal uh, does the recommendation letter really matter if a university doesn't mention it in requirements so does that happen Sure, sure. So my best advice is to submit to a university what has been requested or required. Um, if a school is not asking for letters of recommendation and you submit them, they may or may not be considered. Uh, that's a question that you can ask, uh, but a good rule of thumb is to just submit what has been indicated as a required uh, piece of the application. Have you ever received, uh, you know, personally at the university, um, things that you didn't expect from students, like supplemental materials? All the time, all the time. And I wish I had time to read all of those. Um, but many of our institutions receive thousands and thousands of applications. And it's so important to us that we're thoroughly reviewing everything that, that we ask for that we know is really important in helping us determine a student's preparedness and fit. So sometimes having uh, numerous other letters or portfolios or other accomplishments, um, while we wish we had the time to look at all of that, um, sometimes we ask you to kind of curate that and make sure that you're sending us the most important pieces, the things that you want Want to make sure are not overlooked. So make sure that everything that's asked for is in the application and then and you can send supplemental things but you can't be sure of what what part that will play in the, in the application. The most important part is to fulfill the requirements. Is that is that right? Exactly. So as I the example I use for students sometimes if we require just one letter of recommendation, you might have asked your math teacher to submit that and that math teacher knows you well. Um, it's a subject that you excel in um, and you really want us to read that letter. But if there are three other letters that happen to be on top of that in your file, we might not get to that really strong letter that was your first priority. So you don't necessarily know how much time we're able to dedicate to that. Uh, and so again, we don't want you to, to possibly uh, cover up some of those more important materials that, that we're really looking for. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question, on average, how many schools should I apply to? I'm sure that's on a lot of students' minds. And it's a contentious question. Uh, some students um, really want to apply to a lot of schools. Uh, they think that that'll improve their chances. Uh, personally, I think a list of six or maybe seven schools is, is adequate, um, again, to, to really have a, a good variety of schools that you feel like you are very well qualified for, where you know you meet their requirements. Um, some that you aspire to, um, where it might be a little bit more of a reach, um, but you know that it's a school that you'd love to attend. Uh, and then others that are right there in the middle. Uh, but in general, you only want to apply to schools that you can really see yourself uh, actually attending uh, and being a good fit at should you be admitted. Okay. Um, thank you very much. The, so the next question is, um, from, from our online viewers, when should I start the process of taking standardized tests as far as applying to schools? 
So with standardized testing, I would say earlier is better, especially we've seen that there are sometimes uh, testing cancellations, there can be other delays. Uh, you might even just get sick on a test day. So waiting until that last possible administration is probably not the best choice. Uh, so as soon as you know that you're going to apply to colleges and universities in the US, that's when I would say start looking at the calendar uh, and plan out. Um, if you have someone at your school, an advisor or an Education USA advisor who can help you to map that out, um, that can be really great. Um, you might want to take a standardized test more than once, um, and you might want to, again, make sure that you're starting the applications early enough um, that you can be really thoughtful in that. You can go back and revise your essays and make sure that everything is there that you want to be there. Can students retake standardized tests? Absolutely. So uh, a very typical process for us is that we'll take the best scores. So if you've taken the SAT uh, maybe once in the spring, and then you've taken it again in the fall, and you score better on one section in the fall, um, we'll do what's called super scoring. Um, and we'll select the best section scores from each testing date. Uh, Again, every school will do that a little bit differently, but typically we're doing what's in your best interest. Uh, and we understand that taking it again might get some of those jitters out. You might have had a little more time to prepare. Uh, and so usually taking it again is not going to be a bad thing. Got it. So again, students should look at each school, but it's typical for schools to take the best score. Exactly. Got it. Thank that's excellent advice for students. Um, so um, let us quickly go back to our viewing groups in Gaza and Nablus to take very last questions, if you have any. Um, Amadist in Gaza, uh, is there a final question that you would like to ask? In the financial aid process, what do you base the information on? For example, like, uh, do you know the income that the family gets or something like that? So what are like the instructions for the admissions? Thank you for, very like, much. For financial aid. Thank you very much, Gaza. So quickly, the question is about financial aid. Um, what do you base the decision on in terms of financial aid? Do I mean, do they look at a family's income? Do they? What's the kind of information that is asked for um, in in incorporating financial aid decisions? Well, just like you know about the common application on the admission side, there are also some frequently used financial aid applications, um, things like the CSS profile, uh, which is put out by the College Board, uh, and there's also an international student financial aid application. So these are the most frequently used financial aid applications through which we're able to understand a student and a family's situation. And yes, we through that we learn about income, we learn about assets, uh, and we learn really about the picture of a family's ability to pay. Uh, and then that allows us to understand what a family might be eligible for. Thank you. So students could Google those forms to see exactly what questions are asked. Absolutely. Correct? Fantastic. Uh, Tamara, any uh, last word of advice that you would like to give our viewers very quickly? Sure. My, my advice would really be there are so many different options in the United States. I encourage you uh, to look beyond rankings, look beyond the names of schools that you know um, to find that right fit uh, and to know that you're welcome here, that our campuses and communities benefit from the, the great diversity of students that we enroll from all over the world. Uh, and so we're very excited um, to keep in touch with you uh, and for us to learn more about you as you learn more about us. Thank you so much. Um, you know, that, that message of welcome is something that we're seeing from campuses uh, all over the world. Um, universities uh, throughout the United States um, are sending a very strong message of welcome through the You Are Welcome Here campaign. Um, and I know that that's something that our, our advisors over the, all over the world are telling students is that communities in the United States uh, are uh, welcoming, you, uh, universities are, and that they're committed to international students. Um, Thank you very much for joining us today, Tamara. And of course, thank you to all our international students, uh, including uh, Min and Nikki. Um, very special thanks to our viewing groups uh, joining us from Gaza and Nablus in the Palestinian territories. We also want to thank viewing group groups gathered around the world who took part today. Um, you can find more information about studying in the United States by visiting the Education USA website at www.educationusa.state.gov. There you can find information on the five steps to U.S. study, locate an Education USA center in your country, one of 426 around the world, connect with us via social media, Media, learn about both in-person and virtual upcoming events, research financial aid opportunities, and much more. Thank you, and please join us for future Education USA interactive web chats. Goodbye from Washington.